Hey you guys and welcome back to Style Study Month! I'm not doing the dance again. If you want to watch it, you can go back and watch last week's video again. <laughs> so as you know, all of December on my channel is all style studies and requested ones at that. Last week we took a look at an artist that does these really beautiful, incredibly stylized portraits, which in case you've missed it, I'll link that video up here, make sure you go watch it. But today we're doing something very different and taking a look at an artist who doesn't really paint very many portraits at all. Today we're going to take a look at the incredible, seriously beautiful concept art of the amazing artist John Park. Seriously, this is a good one. This video was requested by Clarence on our Discord server. So hi Clarence, thank you so much for the request. I definitely learned a ton from this study and I really hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Now, if you're here for the first time and this is your very first style study, hi, welcome! My name is Rish and I'm so glad you're here because today we're going to level up your art by like a million percent. Style study is a regular series we do here on my channel where we take a look at some of our favourite contemporary artists, analyse their work and see what we can learn from it. Keyword, learn. We're not here to plagiarise anyone's work or copy their style, we're only here to learn some really cool art tips and tricks and see how we can apply them to finding our own unique art style. I usually structure my style studies in three parts. In part one, we'll take a look at John's work, analyse his style and see what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of his original paintings. The incredible reference I've chosen today is this one. And in part three, we'll apply everything that we learned today to an original painting of our own. As always, if you enjoy this video today and learn something, please remember to like, comment, and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the rest of Style Study Month. But now, yeah, whenever you're ready, grab a snack, sit back, and let's dive into another style study featuring John Park. John Park is a concept artist and art director from the US. He is the co-founder of Brainstorm School, an art school located in LA. Brainstorm actually has some really big names coming in to run courses for them, one of whom is my all-time favorite art instructor, Cynics. After graduating from the Art Center College of Design in California, John has worked on several well-known projects in the film, video game, and even theme park industries. He's worked on movies such as Maze Runner, Godzilla, Deadpool, Wonder Woman, and the Avatar sequels. He's worked with video game companies like Naughty Dog and Sony Games, and he's worked with Walt Disney Imagineering. This is around where I tell you how many social media followers he has, but the man has pretty much nothing apart from his portfolio website on the internet. So, um, yeah. John's entire portfolio is filled to the brim with these incredible concept art pieces that feel like you're taking a dive into alternative realities. But what's fascinating is you'll see a lot of depth in his work, but it's not necessarily super realistic. It's all very impressionistic. I was talking to someone about this style when I realized that John's work is actually very deeply focused on color and light as opposed to compositional elements. It's a little strange because as concept art, you expect storytelling to come from all the details and all the objects and characters in the scene, but John's style stands very far apart from most concept art out there because it tells a story by setting a mood. It's a very unique approach to concept conceptualizing, which is what makes him an anomalist. Speaking of lists, here are four key characteristics to John's art. First things first, you'll see that in the vast majority of John's work, pretty much all of it really, the primary light source is always natural. So it's either light from the sun or the sky in general, which is most of it really, or something like a fire. It is extremely rare for the key light to come from an artificial source. 
And nine times out of 10, the light is gentle and diffused. That's not to say that the light is always muted, but rather it spreads a lot and very gently turns into ambient shadow. This piece that he did for Uncharted 4 is my favourite example of this effect because while you can see a super bright key light from the sky, notice how when it comes towards the foreground it gradually goes dark. Ugh, the ambience, it gets me every time. Sure, you'll see harsh shadows as in really dark tones right next to a super bright highlight, but these are very specifically placed. First off, these super high contrasts are not globally placed all around the scene. Most of the shadowy areas, like we saw, kind of only gradually go into the light. But what's interesting is that the super high contrast usually lies at the primary point of focus. This piece from his work on Hawken is a great example of this because the giant mech suit right at the center of the scene is the point of highest contrast which immediately makes it stand out as the primary point of focus. Same thing here with this relatively simpler scene. You see that the highest contrast lies where the tall tree stands out in stark contrast to the bright background. Boom, it grabs your attention that quickly. John also uses a lot of lost details in both the darkest shadows and the brightest highlights and I just really like how it injects a ton of realism into the otherwise impressionistic scene. Another important mood generating element is actually the colour saturation. Just like with the contrast, the saturation is highest at the primary point of focus, usually either far in the background or really up close in the foreground. Just like with the shadows, the saturation kind of gradually goes lower as you go further away from the focal point. It's subtle, but it definitely works. So, as you may have guessed, a lot of John's work is based on these really dramatic landscapes. You might see the rare character piece, but for the most part, it's environments. You'll also see the occasional characters within the scene, but they're painted in such a way that they complement the environment rather than taking focus away from it. Here, for instance, there's four knights in the scene. You know they're there and you can see that they are a big part of the story, but somehow they kind of only add to the beautiful environment around them. It's like John uses these characters to further enhance the landscape, kind of like how most concept artists and illustrators use the environment to enhance a character. Now, like I said earlier today, it feels like although this is all concept art, I mean, look at it, it's these otherworldly concepts, the storytelling doesn't necessarily come from the compositional elements, but rather from the overall mood of the piece. Between the colour palette and the contrast, as we just saw, there is a lot of storytelling that lies in between the lines. You'll see that most of the colour palettes are either complementary or split complementary, which keeps it all very simple and straightforward. And in fact, there are very specific palettes that John uses in order to depict specific subjects. With the more historical looking paintings like this one with these knights on horseback, you'll see a lot of red-green complements. Same here with something from the slightly nearer past, what looks like one of the historical wars, there's a lot of red and green. And what's funny is, with something like this scene, even though this rocket launcher looking thing might well be very futuristic, it still looks like an old worldy image because again, it uses that red-green palette. And I actually think this might be because the red-green palette, in the way that John uses it, is almost reminiscent of the sepia colouring that you see applied to old photographs. All the shadows are this muddy green and all the bright points are a golden tone. It's a very vintage looking effect. On the contrary, with scenes he wants to show to be more futuristic, the palette changes entirely. Now you start to see more blue-orange palettes. 
sometimes with a bit of purple thrown in there i think this might just be how we perceive the world in general because blues and purples often signify the unnatural high-tech elements around us but the one through line across all the paintings is that every single scene feels normal like nothing feels out of place at all everything feels like it is exactly how it should be let's try to figure out why that is So we've looked at a lot of style studies so far and the vast majority of them feature very fast paced dynamic compositions. However, with John's work, it feels like everything is just way more calm. Like you look at his art and it feels like taking a deep breath. I think a big part of this is the fact that while John uses a lot of leading lines, they are for the most part horizontal or vertical. And on the rare occasion you do see a diagonal leading line, they are usually curved so it's not extremely fast paced, everything feels quite chill and slow moving. The vast majority of John's art feels like it is from another time, either far back in the past with the knights in armour on horseback or far into the dystopian future with mechs and damaged buildings. And even with scenes that could feasibly be set in the present day, there's something about the way it is rendered that really feels pushed either into the past or the future. I think the big reason for this feeling is that when you look at all the compositional elements, it's like you either only see historical elements or you only see futuristic elements. It feels like there's no in-between or juxtaposition between elements that signify both time periods, whereas in the present, as a society, we kind of live in the in-between. I don't know if that makes sense or even if it is an intentional composition choice, but I just thought it is very interesting. John almost always exclusively paints outdoor scenes, sometimes including some larger than life elements. So here for instance, you'll see these massive eight skulls, which kind of make you think of all the old legends where giants used to run the earth. There's usually other life-sized elements that tell us about the relative scale though, which is how you know these are massive. Like here with this huge satellite dish, you can tell it is way bigger than the other dishes around it, maybe it transmits signals to a different galaxy. The point is, there is so much subtlety in John's compositional choices that we don't even register consciously, but they kind of tell our subconscious mind some very fascinating stories. That is what makes him such an incredible concept artist. When it comes to the rendering, John's art is all about the shapes. Where possible, you'll see that his art style seems reductive, for lack of a better word. Like, when you look closely at the rendering, you see that a lot of the dimensions are basically just made of a bunch of flat shapes of different values placed close together. Like, look at the flowers in the field here. Although at first glance you see a bunch of flowers, when you really look at them, it's literally a bunch of bright yellow spots here, and then they blend into each other to form a fairly flat sort of band further back. The answer is always to simplify, which is what makes this style a lot more impressionistic than realistic. Another detail that really adds to the impressionism is all the textured brushwork. I think his cowboy series is where you see the brush strokes best, and though I'm pretty sure he paints with digital oil brushes for the most part, it feels like there is also a lot of chalky, charcoal-y texture in a lot of the large, flat areas. Like we just saw, the composition and leading lines in John's art tend to be rather calm, but the issue with that is that it can sometimes become a little too static, and I feel like this is why having so much impressionistic texture really helps, because it breaks up those big flat shapes and straight lines. The texture adds a subtle sense of dynamism, which keeps the composition from appearing too still. So, to sum up part one of the study, here are four key characteristics to John Park's work. 
Number one, the storytelling is primarily rooted in mood as opposed to things like compositional elements. The primary key light is almost always of natural origin and the highest contrast and saturation lie at the point of focus. Two, John usually paints environment pieces where although you do see some characters, they are usually there to enhance the scene, not the other way around. Three, the leading lines are often horizontal, vertical, or curved, which makes the composition feel a lot slower, a lot calmer than we see in most stylized art. And number four, the rendering is usually made up of flat shapes and textured brushwork adds some nice movement to an otherwise static composition. For our study today, this is the reference that I've chosen. Now, I specifically chose a character piece here because it would be way more of a challenge than the languid, slow-paced compositions of John's environment paintings. And I also really wanted to do a landscape piece for part three, so here we are. <laughs> I think this was literally the roughest sketch I've ever done in my life because I just couldn't wait to get into the rendering process. Look at how much beautiful texture there is in the original. I simply couldn't go too long without playing. I started by first trying to get as much of the background information down as possible. Now, here's the big challenge with studying a style like John's. Because the background has so much texture that has no doubt been built up over several hours of work, it's kind of hard to A, color match perfectly, and B, build up the exact textures. And bonus challenge C, everything is impressionistic, meaning there aren't very many defining edges that can help us separate the piece into tangible layers or anything. It all felt very a la prima. Moving on to the character, here my biggest challenge was probably getting that metal right. I really, really struggled with making it not look super dull because unlike with a colored metal like gold or bronze, with silver slash iron, you can't just rely on saturation to liven it up. And then add that impressionistic brushwork into the mix. It was like trying to make it look like shiny metals while actively throwing a wrench into it by creating lots of extra texture. Once I had all the big colors and values in place, however, the real challenge was trying to get the composition to match the original. Now, this is the most rookie mistake in the world, but it is just extraordinarily easy to make with this type of rendering. We get so caught up in the details that we completely miss the big picture. Best believe there was a lot of warping, liquefying, and rescaling involved, just trying really hard to make the compositions match as best as I could. I did end up throwing in a bunch of photo texture to expedite the texturing process here, because I couldn't for the life of me find a brush that would recreate all of those background details as quickly. But hey, we use the tools that we have at our disposal in order to paint efficiently. All in all, huge fan of how this study turned out, but what do you think? Alrighty, time to dig into the first environment piece I've done in a long, long time. Was I nervous as hell about this? Absolutely I was. I started in my sketchbook, and in terms of the concept, I wanted to include one of those larger than life elements because I really like that in John's art, and I wanted it to be a massive dog because, well, I want one. But as I was clarifying the sketch, I remembered that actually the priority should be the mood, not necessarily the actual elements. So the second I had a vague idea of what I wanted to paint, I started to put down some colors. Because this felt kind of like a bit of an old worldy scene, I figured the red green palette is certainly the way to go. Over time, I ended up adding a secondary orange-blue element because I thought it would be super cool to kind of mix the two eras, maybe make this look like a futuristic world where society has had to return to a more primitive lifestyle. 
I don't know, I just wanted more colour in there. I also really wanted that light from the background to go gradually into a foreground shadow and let me tell you, it was frustrating to have to do that with a lot of hard edges. One thing I really really enjoyed was darkening up that giant dog because that fur was gradually built up. Towards the end I warmed everything up giving it a sort of muted golden hour look and oh I love this mood so much. It's like a watercolour sunset and ugh, this is my favourite kind of weather honestly. Also I have literally never used any oil brushes this much in a painting before and while it isn't necessarily something I'll reach for with my own style of painting, it is definitely a beautiful texture here. All in all, a really fun painting process that I absolutely enjoyed and also learned so much from. And there we have it, John Park Demystified. Man, I cannot remember the last time I had so much impressionism and texture in a painting. Yeah, we had some last week, but nothing to this extent. That's definitely something I'm taking with me going forward. But what was your biggest takeaway from this study? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much again to Clarence for requesting this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and that it's everything you've been looking for. And if the rest of you guys have enjoyed this video as well, please do remember to like and subscribe. Make sure you turn your notifications on because you don't want to miss the rest of Style Study Month. Come say hello on Instagram and Discord. The links are down in the description and if you want to support my channel and grab my custom brush kit you can check it all out on my patreon i'll leave a link up here in the cards and that would be incredible thank you so much for your support are there any other artists you'd like to see a style study on in the future first check out my style study playlist i'll leave it here in the outro somewhere down here i've done a ton of these already and chances are i've covered some of your faves on the series in the past but in case i haven't feel free to leave a comment below letting me know what artists you like to see a star study on or better yet come tell me in my discord server so it doesn't get lost in the comments but yeah that's everything i have to say today so thank you guys so so much for hanging out with me i really hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have check out some more style studies down here happy style study month and i'll see you guys on the next one bye